All right, so we're in Judges chapter 13. New enemy this week, right? Remember last week we talked about Jephthah, and uh, we saw early on in chapter 10 um, that God uh, delivered the children of Israel into the hands of Ammon and the Philistines, it says. But then when you read through Jephthah's, I'm not, not Judges 10, Judges 11 and 12, sorry. So Judges 11 and 12, we saw how God used Jephthah to rescue the children of Israel from the hand of Ammon. Well, now we learn about the Philistines. So God, you know, typical story of the children of Israel, you know, they get back, then they go right back into sin. You know, remember, that's just how the whole story of Judges is, just up and down, up and down. You know, they get on fire, they rebel. So it starts off with a new enemy here, the Philistines, and you basically, from here on out, you know, the Philistines are like the main, you know, the main foes of the children of Israel for, for many, many years to come. And uh, so we're here in Judges uh, chapter 13, and so what, like I said during the announcements, what we're going to do is we're just going to take an overview look at Samson's life, right? You know, chapter 13 goes over uh, basically how God's working in his parents' life before he you know, was born and stuff, and gives us some insight onto how he was to be brought up. And so what I want you to do is to keep your place there, obviously, but go to Numbers chapter 6. Numbers chapter 6. And so we saw from uh, what we just read that the chapter is about Manoah. It's about Manoah's wife or Samson's mother. You know, we read about the angel uh, from the Lord that gives him, you know, these instructions on how to raise Samson. And, uh, you know, the angel says, you know, thou art barren. You know, you, you can't bear children now, but you are going to have a son. You are, and this is what you're supposed to do. Uh, so in verse 4, he says, you know, you just go to number 6, but he says, Now therefore beware, I pray thee, and drink not wine, nor strong drink, and eat not any unclean thing. For lo, thou shalt conceive and bear a son, and no razor shall come upon his head. For the child shall be a Nazarite unto God from the womb, and he shall begin to deliver Israel out of the hand of the Philistines. Now, it's important uh, for us to understand what a Nazarite vow is. So what I like to do before I read the book of Judges, or, or specifically before I get into Samson, is I like to review Numbers chapter 6, just so it's fresh in my mind, you know, just so that when I'm reading through these next three chapters, I can, you know, uh, diligently audit Samson's life, rather. You know, because the better you understand the Nazarite vow, the more you're going to understand how much Samson violated this vow later on in his life. So let's just uh, read a few of these verses here about the Nazarite vow. Number six, like I said, you, know, you don't have to memorize this. Just maybe write it down, you know, next to, uh, you know, Judges 13 or 14 or wherever, you know, you, you, you would like. If you don't mind writing in your Bible, that way the next time you come read through, you can reference back to this. But Numbers uh, chapter 6, verse 1, it says, And the Lord spake unto Moses, saying, Speak unto the children of Israel, and say unto them, When either man or woman shall separate themselves to vow a vow of a Nazarite, to separate themselves unto the Lord, he shall separate himself from wine, and strong drink, and shall drink no vinegar of wine, or vinegar of strong drink. Neither shall he drink any liquor of grapes, nor eat moist grapes, or dried. All the days of his separation shall he eat nothing that is made of the vine tree, from the kernels even to the husk. So a lot of people say, well, Samson was, just wasn't supposed to drink alcoholic wine. You know, but that's not the full story here, is it? He's not supposed to eat anything of the vine. Look at verse 4 again. All the days of his separation shall he eat nothing that is made of the vine tree, from the kernels even to the husk. All the days of the vow of his separation, there shall no razor come upon his head, until the days be fulfilled, in the which he separateth himself unto the Lord. He shall be holy, and shall let the locks of the hair of his head grow. In verse 6, All the days that he separateth himself unto the Lord, he shall come at no dead body. And so you're going to see that Samson pretty much violates a lot of these things right off the bat. Verse 7, it says, He shall not make himself unclean for his father or his mother or his brother or for his sister when they die because the, uh, the consecration of his God is upon his head. All the days of his separation he is holy unto the Lord. Verse 9, And if any man die very suddenly by him, and he hath defiled the head of his consecration, then he shall shave his head in the day of his cleansing. On the seventh day shall he shave it. And on the eighth day he shall bring two turtles or two young pigeons to the priest to the door of the tabernacle of the congregation. And the priest shall offer the one for a sin offering and the other for a burnt offering and make an atonement for him for that he sinned by the dead and shall hollow his head that same day. So we'll just stop there. Go back to Judges chapter 13. 
And so I just wanted you to see that, just understand that that's where that comes from. So when the angel says, hey, he's going to be raised a Nazarite from the womb, you know, it's good to have that fresh in your mind when you read through this, because, you know, like I said, as we study Samson, you'll see that he touches dead things. You know, he, he does a lot of unclean things, a lot of unsavory things in his life. You know, and this is also a good story, you know, when you're out soul winning because Samson was a person that had a lot of sins, did a lot of things wrong. But nonetheless, the Bible still speaks of him in a very positive manner. We know, we understand that he's saved, you know. And so just like King Saul, sometimes we use that out soul winning, right? You know, hey, well, Saul did all these wicked acts, but Samuel said, today thou be with me. You know, it, it's the same thing with Samson, you know, just another great one, just disobedience after disobedience, sin after sin. But yet God still used him. God still used him in a mighty way. And so there's a lot to learn from him. And we'll come back through later on, you know, uh, maybe next year, and we'll do a whole series on Samson. But like I said, for tonight, I just want to do an overview of his life. Uh, so jump down to verse number 24 on Judges chapter 13. It says, And the woman bare a son and called his name Samson, and the child grew, and the Lord blessed him. And the Spirit of the Lord began to move him at times in the camp of Dan between Zorah and Eshtael. If you remember in Joshua um, chapter 19, when they were dividing the land, the portion that Dan got was from Zorah to Eshtol. So that's why he references that there. It's just saying that, hey, you know, this is the, the lot of land where they, where they live. So go over to chapter 14. We're going to take a look at his first blunder with women. So you're going to see that he makes uh, quite a few mistakes with the ladies, just like a lot of the men in the Bible did. Um, and we'll just get right into it here. Look at verse number one of chapter 14. It says, And Samson went down to Timnath and saw a woman in Timnath of the daughters of the Philistines. So there's his first problem, right? It says he went down to Timnath and saw a woman. So he lays his eyes on this woman. He's like, wow, she's really beautiful. Wow, I really desire her. Look at verse 2. And he came up and told his father and his mother and said, I have seen a woman in Timnath of the daughters of the Philistines. Now, therefore, get her for me to wife. Then his father and his mother said unto him, Is there never a woman among the daughters of thy brethren or among thy people that thou goest to take a wife of the uncircumcised Philistines? And Samson said unto his father, Get her for me, for she pleaseth me well. So he's kind of a brat, too, you know. He's like, hey, I don't care what the law says. Get her for me. I really want her, right? You know, so he, Samson's made it, you know, very clear what he wants. And, uh, you know, it's important that we understand that this thing actually comes from God. So look at verse 4. It says, But his father and his mother knew not that it was of the Lord that he sought an occasion against the Philistines. For at that time, the Philistines had dominion over Israel. And so we can see that God's... Uh, basically, he's formulating a plan on how to use Samson to deliver the children of Israel out of the hands and the bondage of the Philistines. And this is where it all begins right here. Now, in verses 5 through 7, it shifts gears into an interesting story where Samson sees a young lion. This lion roars at him. And the Spirit of God comes on Samson and he literally tears this lion to pieces like it's nothing. He just kills it with his bare hands. Now, Samson, obviously, it doesn't say what he looked like. I don't personally believe that he was maybe a big rip person, you know, uh, big like that. I think he was probably just a normal size, maybe like the rest of the Danites. Because, you know, when we read later on, people were like, the, the Philistines were like, wherein lies his great strength? You know, nobody can do these feats except for something's going on here. This is above, you know, T-ball and DECA and all these other steroids that are out there. Human growth hormone, right? It's not just all that stuff. Something else is going on here with this guy. And so he tears this lion apart. And then, let's see, look down here. Look at verse number eight. It says, and after a time, he returned to take her. So he goes down, you know, the, the, he speaks with this woman in Tim. Now she pleases him well. Remember, this is of the Lord. And it says, and after a time, he returned to take her. And he turned aside to see the carcass of the lion. And behold, there was a swarm of bees and honey in the carcass of the lion. That's gross. And then look at verse 9. It says, and he took thereof in his hands and went on eating and came to his father and mother and he gave them and they did eat, but he told them, or he told not them that he had taken the honey out of the carcass of the lion. And that reminds me of this verse uh, in first Corinthians 10, where it says whatsoever is sold, uh, yeah, sold in the shambles, you know, ask no questions <laughs> about what it is, you know, for conscience sake. And uh, maybe Samson knew that and was like, yeah, I'm not going to tell mom and dad where they got this. So they'll, they'll be fine. You know, here you go, mom, here you go, dad, you know, eat this honey. I'm eating it and it's just fine. But you know, was that, a savory thing for him to do? No, he was supposed to be a Nazarite from the womb, right? And we just read in Numbers chapter 6 that that would definitely violate that law. And so right off the bat, you can see that Samson, you know, though he, he does have tremendous faith, he, he, you know, he's definitely on God's side. He's not a 
you know, a heathen or a bad guy in that sense. But nonetheless, you know, he's a sinner like the rest of us. And, you know, he definitely wasn't, you know, taking, <laughs> you know, any kind of any kind of trash from anybody. And, you know, he just did what he wanted a lot of times. He's kind of selfish, you know, he, he wanted what he wanted. You know, he saw the woman, you know, his parents tried to talk him out of it. And he said, no, I want her anyways. And he's going to do that again here in chapter 16. You know, he goes by and sees this candy, you know, this honey and the dead carcass of a lion after a process of time. It's like, ah, it's fine. It's honey. You know what they say about honey, right? Like it doesn't ever go bad. Maybe he was thinking like, what's sanitary? And it, you know, I'll just, I'll just maybe grab from the middle there and just not touch the rib cage of the lion or whatever. And he, he goes on there. Now jump down to uh, verse 12. So what happens from here is that Samson, he issues a challenge in the form of a riddle to the Philistines. And if you look at verse 12, it says, And Samson said unto them, I will now put forth a riddle unto you, if you can certainly declare it me within the seven days of the feast, and find it out, then I will give you 30 sheets and 30 change of garments. Verse 13, But if you cannot declare it me, then shall ye give me 30 sheets and 30 change of garments. And they said unto him, Put forth thy riddle, that we may hear it. So he's going to go on and explain this riddle here. Verse 15, it says, And it came to pass on the seventh day that they said unto Samson's wife, Entice thy husband that he may declare unto us the riddle, lest we burn thee in thy father's house with fire. Have ye called us to take uh, that we have? Is it not so? And so, you know, they can't figure out the riddle. So in verse 15, the Philistines, they get smart. They say, okay, well, what we're going to do So we're just going to go up to his wife, go up to this woman and say, hey, he's destroying our people. You know, he's mocking us. He's making fun of us. You need to tell us what's going on. You know, and the Bible says, you know, that, um, that women, and we'll, we'll read the verse later on, but, uh, you know, the wrong type of women in your life, they can cause you to do some bad things. And, you know, they knew that. They knew that if they could get to her heart, and sway her and persuade her to turn on her husband that they would get the answer here now look at verse 16 it says and samson's wife wept before him and said thou thou dost but hate me and lovest me not thou hast put forth a riddle unto the children of my people and hast not told it me and he said unto her behold i have not told it my father nor my mother and shall I tell it thee? So this whole situation is just messed up. Her loyalty is to her people, the Philistines, right? He's in an unequally yoked relationship here. And Samson, you know, his loyalties to his parents. And you're going to see that at the end of the chapter here as well. You know, when you get married, your loyalty should be to each other. That's why the Bible is very clear that we should marry somebody that we're equally yoked with. You know, right. believers should never marry outside, you know, heathens or people that aren't saved. You're taking a huge risk. You're going to regret it for the rest of your life because there's no guarantee whether or not that person's actually going to get saved and get on fire and come on board with the truth. You know, and Samson, you know, he's, he's dealing with that right now. So verse 17, it says, And she wept before him the seven days while their feast lasted. And it came to pass on the seventh day that he told her, because she lay sore upon him, and she told the riddle to the children of her people. So she just basically vexes his soul. You know, it says about Delilah, his third wife, in, in chapter 16, that she vexed his soul unto death. You know, just, where's your great strength lie? So it's important to put the stop to stuff like this. You know, when somebody just keeps coming at you for something and you don't want to tell them, you don't want to tell them, you know, it's better just to, just to cut it off. You know, stop asking me altogether. That's what Samson should have done. He said, you know what? I've, I've made the decision here. I'm not telling you. Stop. But he didn't do that, obviously. And he allowed her to keep coming at him and keep coming at him. And she wore him down. Now look at verse 18. And the men of the city said unto him on the seventh day before the sun went down, What is sweeter than honey and what is stronger than a lion? And he said unto them, If he had not plowed with my heifer, he had not found out my riddle. So, you know, who said that God doesn't have a sense of humor? Okay. You know, it's funny how God just... just records what Samson said. Now, guys, don't say that about your wife when you're angry, right? We've all said things before when we're angry, and I would not recommend you say something like this. If you had not plowed with my heifer, you know, you had not found out my riddle. So Samson, obviously being very, uh, very upset, extremely angry here. Look at verse 19. And the Spirit of the Lord came upon him, and he went down to Ashkelon and slew 30 men of them and took their spoil and gave change of garments unto them, which expounded the riddle. And his anger was kindled and look at this next part. And he went up to his father's house. So he does good. He makes good on his promise. He said, hey, I'll give whoever figures this out, these 30 changes of raiment. You know, and God, I believe, you know, working behind the scenes here, you know, willing to use Samson as a, as a, uh, a savior to the people, allows them to find out and then puts it on Samson's heart to go and kill these 30 Philistines. And that's going to start a whole slew of problems. 
But then it says that he, you know, his anger is kindled and he goes up to his father's house. Again, that's the wrong answer. You know, once you're married, once you make that commitment, you need to stay with that person. You need to just work out your problems. You know, there's no more going back to mommy and daddy. We're supposed to leave and cleave. And then in verse 20, it says, but Samson's wife was given to his companion whom he uh, used as his friend. Now turn to Matthew chapter 19. Matthew chapter 19 real quick. Let's just take a look at what Jesus said about this very subject here. Like I said, you can already see Samson's disobedience, um, you know, in, in several different aspects, just right off the bat in chapter 14, you know, and, and we just read that that's the wrong attitude to have. You know, I know tons of people, tons of people, tons of people that have this attitude, you know, when my spouse gets me upset, I'm just going to, what they'll say is that I'm leaving. I'll just go back to my mom's or I'll go back to my dad's or I'll go to my cousin or whoever. Right? That's never the right answer. If you want to destroy your marriage, go ahead and put your family, go ahead and put your mom and dad above your spouse. Go ahead and put your cousin, your best friend, you know, the girls, the ladies, the dudes at work or whatever above your spouse and watch your marriage crumble. Amen. That's what's going to happen. Now look at what Jesus said about this same subject. Matthew chapter 19, look at verse 3. So Matthew 19, 3, it says, The Pharisees also came unto him, tempting him, and saying unto him, Is it lawful for a man to put away his wife for every cause? And he answered and said unto them, Have ye not read that he which made them at the beginning made them male and female? And he and said, For this cause shall a man leave father and mother and cleave to his wife, and they twain shall be one flesh. Wherefore they are no more twain but one flesh. What therefore God hath joined together, let not man put asunder. And that word asunder there means in half. So what Jesus is saying, hey, let nobody cut in half what God has joined together. You know, hopefully Manoah, it does, the Bible doesn't say, but it would have been nice if Manoah had said, hey, Samson, you need to get back to your wife. You wanted her. You made the commitment. You took the vows. Now you need to go deal with the consequences. You need to straighten her out. If you're unhappy with what she did, how she listened to her companions, and maybe you need to be around more. Maybe you need to do more. Maybe you need to pray more. Maybe you need to seek God's counsel more. But he didn't do that. He went crying back to mommy and daddy. And you know what? You're going to see the consequences here in chapter 15 right off the bat. So go back to Judges chapter 15. And actually, you just saw the last verse of chapter 14. You know, the Philistines, they don't, have, they don't care about God's law. You know, they're like, whatever. We'll just give them to your best friend. You know, we'll just give her away. You know, it's what well, you left. So eh, who cares? You know, so look at verse number one of chapter 15. It says, but it came to pass within a while after in this, uh, the time of wheat harvest that Samson visited his wife with a kid. And he said, I will go into my wife into the chamber, but her father would not suffer. Uh, but her father would not suffer him to go in. And her father said, I verily thought that thou hadst utterly hated her. Therefore, I gave her to thy companion. Is not her younger sister fairer than she? Take her, I pray thee, instead of her. So you see, they really don't have a high view, <laughs> a high valued uh, view of women in this culture, do they? They're like, who cares, man? Get over it. You know, I know you took a vow. I know it was your wife. Just give me the goat. Give me the kid and take her sister. You know, it's like, what, what kind of people are we dealing with here? Do you see why God wants to destroy these people? Why God said they shouldn't have been allowed to live in the first place, you know, in the books leading up to this. I mean, it's real clear. And, you know, in this verse number one here where it says that Samson visited his wife with a kid, keep in mind, he's not talking about a, a human child. The, the Bible uses the word kid to describe a young goat. And so I just wanted to make sure none of the young bucks in here are confused about that. So <laughs> look at uh, verse number three. It says, And Samson said concerning them, Now shall I be more blameless than the Philistines, though I do them a displeasure. And Samson went and caught 300 foxes and took firebrands and turned tail to tail and put uh, a firebrand in the midst between two tails. And when he had set the brands on fire, he let them go into the standing corn of the Philistines and burnt up both the shocks and also the standing corn with the vineyards and olives. You know, the Bible says that jealousy is a rage of the man. You know, you can read about that in Proverbs. And so, you know, rightfully so. That was his wife, even though he didn't act right. You know, he made a mistake here. He sinned. He should not have gone back to his dad's house. He should have dealt with his problems, you know, at face value right up front. But nonetheless, you know, his wife's now married to somebody else and he's angry, you know. And so he goes and he burns the crops. So jump down to verse number nine here. Because these guys are, you know, the Philistines, obviously, you know, naturally upset. In verse number nine, it says, Then the Philistines went up 
and pitched in Judah and spread themselves in Lehi. And the men of Judah said, Why are ye come up against us? And they answered, To bind Samson are we come up to do to him as he hath done to us. So keep in mind, the Philistines control Israel at this time. And so now they're really upset because Samson, you know, he got mad and he preached a hard sermon and you know, tied up these foxes and burnt down their crops and caused a big ruckus. And so now the enemy is coming against Judah and they're like, whoa, you know, why are you guys coming at us? You know what this reminds me of? It reminds me of, you know, when one of our friends or, or we say something or we preach the truth and other Christians and other churches get mad at us and they're like, whoa, you know, what, what's going on here? So look down here at verse number 12. It's, I'm sorry, verse number 11, it says, Then 3,000 men of Judah went up to the top of the rock, Etam, and said to Samson, Knowest thou not that the Philistines are rulers over us? What is this that thou hast done unto us? And he said unto them, As they did unto me, so have I done unto them. So Samson's like, look, they wronged me, so I just got even. I just got back with them. But the Jews, they're fearful here. They are not the Jews, they're the children of Judah. They're not Jews yet here. We just went over that this morning. But they're angry, right? They're like, why are you doing this? You're bringing this reproach on us. And now they want to come invade us. Now they want to fight us, Samson. So we're going to turn you in. And that's kind of what I'm talking about. You know, it's like when this reminds me of when somebody has the guts to preach against the Sodomites or preach against the Pentecostals or preach against, you know, the, the IFB church churches that are preaching repent of your sins, you know, and then maybe the media or Facebook or the community turns on, you know, all Christians. And then what do they do? They always come back to us, to, to the person that says, hey, why are you doing this? Why are you making such a big deal about repenting your sins? Why are you making such a big deal about these sodomites and pride month and stuff like that? Don't you know that the sodomites run the nation? Don't you know that they're going to come and take our church buildings from us? Don't you know they're going to come take our cars or jet skis or boats or liberties? You know, we're saying, hey, look, we're just doing to them what they've done to us, right? We're just, we're just trying to preach the truth. We're just trying to do what God said to do. You know, they're the enemy. God's going to deliver them into our hands. And we, we just read Revelation this morning. We understand that we are going to win, right? And so there's nothing to be fearful of. We ought to take the same type of stand that Samson did and just go head to head with the enemy. I mean, why not? What do you have to lose? You really have nothing to lose. You know, those of us who are saved... You know, it's we we win we win the victory in the end, and so there's nothing to be afraid of. There's nothing, you know. And that was Samson's attitude. You know, he did these things by faith. Obviously, he's pretty upset, but you know, uh, nonetheless, the Bible says in Hebrews 11 that he was a great man of faith. So look at verse number 12. And they said unto him, We are come down to bind thee. We may deliver thee into the hand of the Philistines. And Samson said unto them, Swear unto me that you will not fall upon me yourselves. And they spake unto him, saying, No, but we will bind thee fast and deliver thee into their hand, but surely we will not kill thee. And they bound him with two new cords and brought him up from the rock. So, you know, Samson's not angry at them, at the children of Judah. He's like, okay, you know, go ahead and turn me in. You know, that had to take some faith because he didn't know exactly what was going to happen. I mean, there's no guarantee. There was no promise at that point in time that he was going to do what he does next, that he was going to you know, win a great victory here. But nonetheless, look at verse number 14. It says, And when he came to Lehi, the Philistines shouted against him, and the Spirit of the Lord came mightily upon him. See, he didn't know that was going to happen, right? He just went in faith. He said, okay, you guys are upset. I, I get it. You guys are, you guys are, you guys are weak. You guys are, you guys are angry. You know, just don't kill me yourselves, right? He loved the brethren. You, you got to understand that there. Samson loved the children of Israel. In fact, the Bible says that he judged them for 20 years. And so he's like, just don't fall upon me yourselves, right? That's faith. That's faith. He had the faith to know that God was somehow going to deliver him. And so verse 15 it says, or I'm sorry, verse 14, read that again. It says, And he came to Lehi, the Philistines shouted against him, and the Spirit of the Lord came mightily upon him. And the cords that were upon his arms became as flax that was burnt with fire, and his bands loosed from off his hands. And, you know, I wonder what the looks on their faces were when they saw that. Because, you know, they're, they're, they're happy. They're like, yes, you know, your own people, finally, they turned you in. They've got you bound. And then all of a sudden, just like nothing, you know, his hands are free. And they had to have just been like, uh-oh, what is this guy going to do now? And then what he does next is, is pretty interesting. Verse 15, and he found a new jawbone of an ass and put forth his hand and took it and slew a thousand men therewith. Verse 16, and Samson said, with the jawbone of an ass, heaps upon heaps, with the jaw of an ass have I slain a thousand men. And it came to pass when he had made an end of speaking that he cast away the jawbone out of his hand and called the place Ramoth Lehi. So there you go. That's the result of the act of faith that he had. He allowed the children of Judah to tie him up and deliver him over. 
And then as a result, you know, the Spirit of God comes upon Samson. He sees something. You know, you got you to keep in mind, they didn't have weapons in that day. Cause when the, the Philistines would take over a nation, the first thing they would do is take away their abilities to make swords and weapons and, and uh, arrows and all that stuff. And he just improvises. He adapts, right? He's got the Spirit of God on him. He's like, I don't, you know, I don't need a sword. I don't need anything. There's something hard. He picks it up and he does business. I mean, think about that. A thousand people with a jawbone that he killed. I mean, it would be hard to kill people with a baseball bat. I mean, I got hit in the head with a baseball bat when I was younger by the, one of the neighbor kids, and it didn't kill me. It definitely took some brain cells from me, I, I'll be honest with you, but it didn't kill me, you know? And so I just wonder, like, this guy, to have that physical energy, you know, and I get the spirit of God's on him and stuff, but man, what a, what a sight that would have been to see. You know, this guy just swinging this thing, and these guys, I mean, just dropping like, like flies. And they would have had weapons, right? The Philistines would have had swords. They would have had shields. They would have had stuff. But Samson, you know, having that strength and that, that spirit of God just, you know, overwhelmed him and, uh, you know, won a great victory there. So look down here at verse number 18. And it says, And he was sore of thirst and called on the Lord and said, Thou hast given this great deliverance uh, into the hand of thy servant. And now shall I die for thirst and fall into the hand of the uncircumcised? But God clave in hollow place that was in the jaw, and there came water thereout. And when he had drunk, his spirit came again, and he revived. Wherefore he called the name therefore in Hakori, which is in Lehi unto this day. And he judged Israel in the days of the Philistines 20 years. Now we're going to go over to, to chapter 16 here. So turn over to Judges chapter 16. And we'll start to take a look at strike number two and three here with the women. And so look at this. It starts off kind of similar to chapter 14 and verse number one. It says, Then went Samson to Gaza and saw there an harlot and went in unto her. Now, obviously, we all know this is wrong. You know, definitely if you're taking the vow of Nazarite. Now, in chapter 14, when he saw his wife, you know, the Bible said that that was from the Lord, that God was going to use that situation to begin to deliver Israel out of the hands of the Philistine. This here, it doesn't say anything like that. This is all Samson here. This is Samson, you know, just backslidden, just definitely wrong. Look at verse 2. It said, And was told the Gazites, uh, saying, Samson has come hither, and they compassed him in, and laid wait for him all the night in the gate of the city, and were quiet all the night, saying, In the morning, when it is day, we shall kill him. Verse 3, And Samson lay till midnight, and arose at midnight, and took the doors of the gate of the city, and the two posts, and went away with them, bar and all, and put them upon his shoulders, and carried them up to the top of an hill, that is before Hebron. So he picks up the whole gate, basically. I mean, think about that. You know, you ever, you, when you read through the, uh, the Old Testament, you often see, you know, he sat in the gate. You know, that's where like the politicians and uh, the bigwigs and stuff would uh, often hang out there. And Samson says, you know, I'm not going to deal. I'm not going to go grab a jawbone of an ass. I'm not going to go grab a bunch of foxes. I'm just going to take your gate and carry it about 37 miles. If you go on Google, and I, like I said, I don't know the exact uh, distance here. But if you just go to Google and type in the distance from Gaza to Hebron, it says it's 37 air miles. Right? And keep in mind, there's terrain and, and different things like that. So this guy, Samson, he picks this thing up, this whole gate of the city, and he walks that entire distance with that on his back. And that news had to have traveled afar. And they're like, okay, look, we've got to stop this guy. We have to figure out a way to, to find the source of his strength. And so what happens next is we get introduced to Delilah. Look at verse number four. And it came to pass afterward that he loved a woman in the valley of Sorek, whose name was Delilah. And the lords of the Philistines came up unto her and said unto her, Entice him and see wherein his great strength lieth, and by what means we may prevail against him, that we may bind him to afflict him. And we will give thee, every one of us, 1,100 pieces of silver. Again, another reason why you don't want to get unequally yoked with the world. Because they're going to do what they've been trained to do, what they've, you know, what they've been sought out to do. You know, she's like, okay, I'll take the money. You see the danger you're getting in here when you, when you yoke up with somebody that doesn't have the same values as you, doesn't have the same beliefs as you. Very dangerous. Jump down to verse number uh, 16. It says, And it came to pass when she pressed him daily with her words and urged him so that his soul was vexed unto death. 
right? So she keeps asking him and he keeps telling her false information. Like, well, if they tie me up this way, you know, and then she goes and tries to do it and he's like, ha ah, I got you. You know, so he's doing a good job so far at not telling her the truth. But the mistake again is the same mistake that he made with his first wife. And that was, he should have stopped it. He should have told her, Hey, stop asking me where my strength comes from. I already told you no. That's what he should have done, but he allows her to continue to bother him, continue to vex him, continue to press forth, you know, for this information. It says, so that his soul was vexed unto death. Now look at verse 17, that he told her all his heart and said unto her, there hath not come a razor upon mine head, for I have been a Nazarite unto God from my mother's womb. If I be shaven, then my strength will go from me, and I shall become weak and be like any other man. For the commandment is... Um, sorry, go to, uh, go, to, go to Proverbs chapter number 6. We'll take a look at this here. Go to Proverbs chapter number 6. So he finally breaks down and he tells her, Hey, look, if they shave my head, I'll become weak as any other man. You know, and she's like, Okay, I've got the jackpot here. I'm going to go tell, you know, my Philistine buddies here and I'm going to collect that fee. I'm going to get that 11, you know, 100 pieces of silver. So you're there in Proverbs number, uh, chapter number six. Look at verse number 23. It says, for the commandment is a lamp and the law is light and reproofs of instruction are the way of life to keep thee from the evil woman, from the flattery of the tongue of a strange woman. Lust not after her beauty in thine heart. Neither let her take thee with her eyelids. And I'm sure that every one of us in here, especially man, I don't know if you guys at work have seen this play out. I've seen numerous times, you know, where, you know, they, the, 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 the organization you're working for, especially when I used to work for the government, you know, they would, they would purposely hire these young women, you know, that look good. They, they like to do that and they couldn't do the job. So they just hang out in the office all day. You know, what they would begin to do is latch onto certain men in the office, you know, and I would tell these guys like, Hey, you know, don't let her, I don't let her take you with her eyelids and countless men would just bypass that information. They would allow that to happen in divorce after divorce, after divorce, after divorce would happen. I mean, the place where I worked, it was like a soap opera. I mean, it was, you could literally make like the best you know, real life television program. I mean, they would become bazillionaires at the end of the year if they were to allow cameras into this place. But nonetheless, you know, the Bible is very clear here. If you look at verse 25, it says, Lust not after her beauty in thine heart, neither let her take thee with her eyelids. It would have done Samson well to have applied this to his life, but he didn't do that. You know, it says, and he saw a woman, you know, and so many men in the old Testament ignored this advice, you know, and they just looked at these women and they said, wow, that one was beautiful. And they married him and it just caused problem after problem. But this is some sound advice, especially for you young guys that aren't married yet. Don't just lust after some woman because of her beauty and don't let her take you with your eyelids because she will destroy your life. Look at verse 26. It says, for by means of a whorish woman, a man is brought to a piece of bread and the adulteress will hunt for the precious life. That is what the Bible says that an adulteress does. They hunt for the precious life. They look for the weak and they prey on them, right? I mean, who, who's a man here who's been at work and seen this? I mean, I can't be the only one. I see it all the time. I see it now even where I work. I mean, it's, it's ridiculous. And the more that we head towards the end here, the more that we head towards those last days, I mean, people, people have no regard for vows anymore. You know what I mean? And so what that does is that causes people like this to fluctuate and multiply in the workforce. And I mean, telling you guys, you got to protect your eyes. You got to watch yourself because these people are out there in numbers. They will hunt you down. And if you're not steadfast, you will fall. Now look at verse number 27. Can a man take fire in his bosom and his clothes not be burned? Look, you're not going to take fire in your bosom and not get burned. You're not going to get her phone number and be like, oh, we're just friends. You're not going to get her Facebook messenger and start messaging her at night and be like, oh, it's cool. It's innocent. Uh-uh you will get burnt and you better remember that i've seen it happen i've seen it happen to christians in our movement don't think oh you know i'm in the new ifb this can't happen to me oh yes it can it happens every single day look this is a grave stern warning watch yourself look samson just got done killing a thousand people with the jaw of an ass and the next thing he's playing around with harlots and now he's lusting after these philistines still Look, just because you have some great victories in your life, don't get puffed up and think that you can't fall prey to sin because any one of us in here can at any time. Turn over to Proverbs chapter 31 real quick. 
in Proverbs chapter 31. Proverbs 31, look at verse number 3. It says, Give not thy strength unto women, nor thy ways to that which destroyeth kings. And you know what? This is how Samson falls. He gives his strength, right? He gave his strength to a woman. And what happened? He perished. He got delivered up into the hands of the Philistines. He gets his eyes poked out. And then he winds up having to basically sacrifice himself in order to take down the Philistines. And we'll go through that here momentarily. But just remember that. It's the Bible says, and this here is a woman giving this advice to her son. Now think about that. Well, I'm not up here being, oh, you're, 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 you say, oh, you're, you're, uh, you're a, what is it, a sexist or a, you're a chauvinist. No, I'm just reading the Bible. It says, give not thy strength to women. You know, men have certain leadership attributes about them, and it would do you good not to give that unto women. Look, do you want to be successful? Do you want to have a great family? Do you want to be a good leader in your household? Don't give your strength to women. You understand? The Bible says that a man is a leader of his house. You need to make the rules. And you know what? Our government doesn't make it very easy for people today, does it? Does it? I mean, women today in our country, they can say, hey, I'm done at any time, and the government will take their back. You know, I kind of wish it was like the days of Ahasuerus, you know, back in Esther, when, uh, when his wife disobeyed, you know, and they basically sent out a proclamation saying, hey, you can't be doing that because that's contagious. And he says, you know, that's going to catch on, and then all the wives are going to be disobedient to their husbands. You know, somebody a long time ago, some Satanist a long time ago in our country probably read that and said, you know what, that's true. If I can just give women more rights than men, give them the ability and the freedom to leave their husbands and put them into bondage, you know, that's how I'm going to destroy this country. And that is a fact. You know, right now it's too easy for women to say, hey, you know what, I'm done. And, you know, whether the husband wants a divorce or not, you know, it's going to happen. And then you're going to be paying child support and all this other garbage for the rest of your life. You know, but we as Christians, we should never fall prey to that. We should never have that attitude. You know, if things don't go my way, I'm just going to leave. You know, you made those vows. We talked about vows last week and how important they are. You made those vows. No matter what happens, you have to honor those and stick to it because God hates when we break our vows, you know, and that's just a good piece of wisdom for you guys. Don't give your strength unto women. You make the decisions. You run your house and you just, you know what? Just let God sort it out. That's the way it's got to be. You know, that's what I do. I tell Jessica, you know, how much bread to make and, you know, I'm just kidding. I give all that stuff onto her, but, you know, that's not my strength. My strength's not in the kitchen. It's working and, you know, doing whatever. So, all right, that's... All right, I'm just, I, had to, I haven't made fun of you in like a week, so I had to... <laughs> no, she's great. Go back to Judges chapter 16 and we'll finish up. No, she's great. She, uh, she takes it uh, very well. But nonetheless, you know, Samson is a good picture of what not to do as a husband. And, you know, if he had children, I'm sure he'd be a good example of not, uh, what not to do as a father. But let's go ahead and finish this up here. Look at verse number 23. So actually in verse number 22, it says, Howbeit the hair of his head began to grow again after he was shaven. Verse 23 says, Then the lords of the Philistines gathered them together to offer a great sacrifice unto Dagon, their God, and to rejoice. For they said, Our God hath delivered Samson, our enemy, into our hand. In verse 24, it says, And when the people saw him, they praised their God. For they said, Our God hath delivered into our hands our enemy. And the destroyer of our country which slew many of us. And it came to pass when their hearts were merry that they said, call for Samson that, they, uh, that he may make sport or make a sport. And they called for Samson out of the prison house and he made them sport and they set him between the pillars. So keep in mind, right? remember when they first captured him, they put out his eyes. You know, so he's blind at this point, you know, but you know, he's grinding in the mill house. You know, they've put him to hard labor and the Bible says that his hair starts to grow back. So it's kind of funny. It's like the Philistines forgot that his hair lied in his strength. So you'd think that they would, if they were diligent, that maybe they would just keep shaving his head to keep him weak, but they forgot, you know, and his hair begins to grow back. Look at verse 25 it says, and it came to pass when their hearts were merry that they said, call for Samson that he may make a sport and jump down to verse number 26. It says, and Samson, uh, said unto to the lad that held him by the hand, Suffer me that I may feel the pillars whereupon the house standeth, that I may lean upon them. Now the house was full of men and women, and all the lords of the Philistines were there. And there were upon the roof about 3,000 men and women that beheld while Samson made sport. 
right? So they're making fun of him. You know, they're making him sport. They're making him a spectacle, right? They're trying to get their gratification, their satisfaction at putting him to shame because of the torture and because of the, you know, the, the, the many people that he killed. And so uh, look at verse 28. And Samson called unto the Lord and said, O Lord God, remember me, I pray thee, and strengthen me. I pray thee only this once, O God, that I may be at once avenged of the Philistines for my two eyes. In verse 29, And Samson took hold of the two middle pillars upon which the house stood, and on which it was borne up of the one with his right hand and the other with his left. Verse 30, And Samson said, Let me die with the Philistines. And he bowed himself with all his might. And the house fell upon the lords and upon all the people that were therein. So the dead which he slew at his death were more than they which he slew in his life. Then his brethren and all the house of his father came, um, yeah, all the house of his father came down and took him and brought him up and buried him between Zorah and Eshdael in the burying place of Manoah's father. And he judged Israel 20 years. So he died killing more people than he killed his entire life. You know, and like I said, Samson's a, you know, a good picture of redemption. You know, we all make mistakes. We all have a past. We all get backslidden, right? But God still, you know, he, he looks at Samson. Samson cries out, he, you know, he's, he's repentant, you know? He's like, you know, hey, Lord, please help me just this once. And God's mercy, you know, just shines forth. And he says, you know what? Okay, I'm going to give you this one victory here. And God winds up using this situation, this negative, horrible, bad situation of him, you know, having his eyes put out, having his life turned upside down. God uses that for a great victory to the children of Israel. And, you know, again, like I said, in the New Testament, he's mentioned as one of the great heroes of the faith. So don't let anybody tell you, oh, well, Samson, I think he went to hell. You know, I've heard people say that. I've heard pastors say that they think that he probably went to hell because he committed suicide. And that's just simply not true. You know, God, why would God grant him, you know, his request and be like, oh, well, have fun down there, buddy. Have fun in the bottomless pit with the locusts and, you know, Ap you know Apollyon and all them guys down there. It doesn't make any sense. So just a real quick uh, recap here. Chapter 14 is where you're going to find the, uh, Samson's uh, feet of tearing the lion. It's where you're going to find that he burnt the Philistines' crops capturing the 300 foxes. Uh, chapter 15 uh, is where Samson breaks the new cords that he was bound with from the children of Israel as burnt flax. And that's where he kills a thousand people with the jawbone of an ass. Chapter 16 is where he picks up the whole gate of the city and carries it from Gaza to Hebron. And then the feat that we just saw here where he kills more Philistines in his death than he did his entire life. And so I just wanted that quick basic overview for you to understand like where, what chapter to go to for which, which feat of strength that he had. You know, it's good to have that navigational tool in your box, you know, so that somebody's talking Bible with you, you know, you can just reference, okay, I know that chapter 14, you know, was the foxes, you know, chapter 15 was this, chapter 16 was that. It's good to just have your, your, your biblical pointer to be able to know where to go and how to find these things. Like I said, there's a whole lot in these chapters that we didn't go over and someday we're gonna come back and we're gonna look at Samson's life in greater detail uh, than we did tonight. But that's all for tonight. Let's bow our heads and have a word of prayer. Lord, thank you so much for your word. I thank you for these stories that we may be able to learn from them and read them, Lord, and not make the same mistakes that uh, our forefathers did. And I just pray that you'd use these things to lift us up, Lord, and be edified uh, and edify one another and encourage one another, Lord, and to uh, get rewards and work hard for you. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Amen.